Good afternoon. I'm Leonard Hamlin, Canon Missioner of the Washington National Cathedral. And I've been given the privilege of welcoming everyone on behalf of our Dean, as well as our Bishop, and behalf of our partners and all to this afternoon's forum and panel greeting, um, where we will engage on the subject of anti-Semitism, Christianity, and the Holocaust, reckoning with the past and working in the present. On behalf of all of my colleagues here at the cathedral, we are grateful to be able to share in this partnership as well as welcome our panelists who will engage us all in dialogue this afternoon. We know that the Washington National Cathedral formally dedicated a new stone carving of Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel on Tuesday, October 12th. The carving which was completed in April 2021, shows Elie Wiesel's likeness inside the cathedral's human rights porch, which features carvings of leading human rights defenders throughout history. The dedication is a collaboration among the cathedral, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and the Elie Wiesel Foundation for Humanity. Building upon the dedication of this carving, we have invited many to join this webinar in order that we would explore the long entangled history of anti-Semitism and Christianity, its implications during the Holocaust, and some of the ways that contemporary theologians, faith leaders, and educators address these legacies today. The program is open to all, and we invite you to submit your questions uh, as you have the chat feature and function. Um, that you will supply questions that may be raised throughout this conversation and raised throughout your experiences. We're grateful to meet you online. And as we were looking forward to meeting in person, we will be looking towards following up with an in-person workshop later in the spring. So we ask that you would keep an eye out for that as well as look forward to joining us. As the Washington National Cathedral is a house of prayer for all people, we hold dear our interfaith relationships and welcome each and everyone here today that we might have a chance to dialogue and engage each other in needed conversations. Recently, I was able to see an article that popped up on the Pew Research Center that said Americans are among the most likely to say that their society has strong religious conflicts. And when we look at these conflicts, roughly half say that there are strong conflicts between people who practice different religions in this country. And many of those say that there are strong conflicts. Well, we have an opportunity on this day to make a step forward to raise some of these ideas and thoughts that have been with us for a long time and hopefully draw closer together. Certainly as an individual, I was given a long time ago and just reminded in these moments of a book that was sitting on my shelf that was written by Elie Wiesel, Messengers of God. And it stated within there, when I was a child, I read these biblical tales with a wonder mixed with anguish. I imagined Isaac at the altar and I cried. I saw Joseph, uh, Prince of Egypt, and I laughed. But he asked the question, why dwell on them? And why now? It falls to the storyteller to explain. Well, we're grateful to welcome our panelists and of course our host and moderator that we may be able to look at perhaps the ideas, the stories that we've been telling and the way it has shaped us and has at times even divided us. The atmosphere that we find ourselves in in this moment is an atmosphere some might call very heated, some might call opportunistic, but what we're praying here at the National Cathedral is that we will take this moment to breathe deeply the opportunity that is before us to draw closer and to help us to unite together as we work. And so I'm thankful for our moderator on today, Rebecca, Dr. Rebecca Carter-Chan. She is the Director of Programs on Ethics 
Religion, and the Holocaust at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Dr. Carter Chan joined the museum in 2018 as a program officer and in 2019 started serving as the acting director of the program on ethics and religion and the Holocaust and, and became the director in 2020. Here, that particular office fosters scholarship, teaching and reflection on the role of religion during the Holocaust and the ways in which religious communities have addressed these legacies since 1945. And so as she serves as director, and it has been a joy to partner with her as well as the museum, we say welcome and we'll allow you to take us from here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leonard. And I can uh, wholeheartedly reciprocate the, the thanks. Uh, it's been so wonderful to work with the cathedral staff um, on this program today. And as we get started, um, before I introduce our panelists, I just want to um, set us up for what's in store um, because today we, we really wanna build on these events of two days ago um, for, for the um, dedication of the new carving. And what we wanna do today is really trace the long history of anti-Jewish ideas and practice within the Christian tradition. And as we consider how this legacy played a role in Nazism and the Holocaust, we want to disentangle the religious, political, racial elements of anti-Semitism, but also acknowledge how they overlap and reinforce one another. And we'll only be able to touch on a few key moments. And so I invite everyone to uh, watch the USHMM's short film on the history of anti-Semitism and to explore some of our online resources and upcoming programs that delve into these topics in more detail. Uh, my colleagues are going to post a, a link to that film in the chat. And in particular, I wanna mention an upcoming webinar, another webinar that we will be holding on um, Sunday, October 17th, this coming Sunday, which will explore the newly opened Vatican archives for the pontificate of Pius XII, who was Pope from 1939 to 58. Uh, and I invite you to, to join. And I think we're going to add the, the link for you to register to that program as well. But what's really exciting about our panel today is that each of our panelists are involved in this ongoing work of teaching about anti-Semitism and theology and facilitating really thoughtful conversations around anti-Semitism among people of different faith backgrounds. So I see this webinar today as an opportunity to ask them some questions about how they go about doing this work and what they think still needs to be addressed, both in Christian circles and in interreligious contexts. Uh, our first panelist is Dr. Philip Cunningham, who is professor of theology and the director of the Institute for Jewish Catholic Relations at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. Second, we have Dr. Benjamin Sachs, who is the Jewish scholar at the Institute for Islamic, Jewish, and Christian Studies in Baltimore. And third is Reverend Dr. Uh, Catherine Zonderiker, who is the William Mead Professor of Systematic Theology at Virginia Theological Seminary in Arlington, Virginia. So my first question is for Phil. I'd like to start um, way back at the beginning uh, with the New Testament and the break between Christianity and Judaism. Because sometimes people accuse the New Testament itself of being anti-Semitic. And certainly there are several passages that have been used to teach contempt for Jews and Judaism over the centuries. So I'm wondering if you could offer some nuance to this complex question. You'll unmute yourself. Sorry about that. You'd think I'd know after this time. Well, first, I'm <laughs> delighted uh, to uh, to be here on this uh, important uh, commemoration of the the work and life of uh, Elie Wiesel. Um, to answer your question with nuance would probably take longer than the, the time that we have, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, first, it's probably important to recall that what eventually became Christianity began with the preaching and the activity of Jesus of Nazareth, and particularly his proclamation that the reign of the God of Israel 
was imminent, that God was about to intervene in the world as they knew it. Um, this claim led to his execution by Roman authorities, who really don't like to hear talk about some other people's God stepping in and intervening. Afterwards, however, some of his followers, all of whom were Jews, became convinced that God had raised the crucified Jesus to the life of the reign of God or the age to come, the very thing that Jesus himself was talking about all the time. And for them, this led them to conclude that God's rule must be indeed arriving, as Jesus had said, because otherwise why would God raise Jesus? That he therefore must be the agent of God, in Hebrew Mashiach, uh, but in the Greek form Christos, Christ, uh, took on a very special meaning for later Christianity, but, but uh, these earliest followers who became convinced that, that Jesus had been raised um, understood that he was going to bring the kingdom into full being uh, in the not too distant future. And therefore it was also possible in this sort of in-between time for non-idolatrous Gentiles, uh, non-Jews who were not engaging in idolatry, to be welcomed into the assemblies of people that uh, all shared the conviction uh, that Christ had been raised and indeed was present among them. Now, most Jews did not embrace that belief. Um, and therefore, the claims that the followers of Jesus made, the Christ believers, I'm not using the word Christian yet because it's too early. That, that word doesn't develop for several decades. Um, but for them, it made no sense, these other Jews, that, that the world was changing and that things were uh, rapidly turning to the way God wanted them to be, particularly when the Jewish-Roman War broke out in the year 66 CE, which resulted in the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 by Roman legions. This, of course, was a traumatic event for all Jews, including Jews in Christ, and, and perhaps even for the Gentiles who were members of the Christ communities. Um, and therefore, when New Testament texts were written, almost all of which were written after the destruction of the temple in 70, the exception being Paul's, the seven letters that everyone has pretty well agreed on that Paul himself wrote probably in the 50s. But other than those letters, the entire New Testament was written after the destruction of the temple, when tensions between Jews in Christ and Jews who were not uh, part of the Christ movement, um, there, these tensions increased. And uh, as a result, um, in the New Testament, there are certain passages that are born out of this inner Jewish tension primarily uh, that, as Rebecca said, were, would go on to have um, a continuing life and influence in subsequent centuries. For example, Matthew 27, 25, where uh, Jews who are in the courtyard of Pilate yell out his blood be on us and on our children, or in John 8, 44, where the Jews are called sons of the devil uh, by Jesus himself. Uh, so uh, this, uh, these uh, sort of fragments or these verses were, that had a polemical nature to them were combined after the New Testament period in later centuries into a whole anti-Jewish theological system that I think Kate will be saying more about in a minute. Um, so now directly to answer your question, uh, Rebecca, at long last, um, I think it is anachronistic to call the New Testament anti-Semitic. If by anti-Semitism, we mean the anti-Semitism that includes a racialist sense that is inimical to Jews because of supposed genetic characteristics. Something like that just doesn't exist in the New Testament world. Uh, it's a later development, really arising in early modernity. But while hostility toward Jews uh, later became rooted in racialist ideas, the older hostility toward them by Christians for not accepting Christ didn't go away. It persisted as well. And these two sort of rationales for, for, uh, for negative feelings toward Jews reinforced one another uh, in the modern period. So there's a, there's a quick, uh, hopefully sufficiently nuanced reply, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Phil. My second question is for Kate. And 
as as Phil just uh, hinted at, as we get into the medieval period, we, we know that anti-Jewish theology is ubiquitous in medieval European Christianity and, and then takes on some new forms in the Protestant Reformation. So I'm wondering if you could describe some of these key aspects of this theology, specifically the term supersessionism, which is, comes up a lot um, in, in these discussions, and also the significance of Martin Luther's writings uh, about Jews. Thank you, um, Dr. Carter Chan. I am honored to be here and to serve with this distinguished panel uh, on this central topic, I think central to the uh, conscience and a uh, very heart of the Christian faith. Um, let me begin with a treatise that Martin Luther wrote toward the end of his life. Uh, in 1543, a, a treatise, really a, a small book appeared under the title, The Jews and Their Lies. And this was a, a long compendium of all of the, the anger, the, um, the fear, the um, suspicion and superstition that medieval uh, Christians, particularly in the West, held about Jews in their midst. Uh, it, it was divided into four large parts. Um, it it uh, went through um, first what, what Luther took to be uh, teachings within scripture that uh, said that uh, Jews were no longer the covenant people of God. Then it had a section dedicated to looking through Israel's scriptures and finding examples uh, as he understood it of um, proofs that um, Jesus was the Christ uh, that showed that Jews did not understand their own texts. Uh, and then began a, um, a final section that had um, particularly virulent um, effect in the um, Western world and the modern period where Luther began to lay out what he took to be rules that should be enforced against Jews, um, including uh, expulsion from various regions, realms, uh, walled cities in Europe, uh, and then a list of things that Christians can and should do against Jews, uh, including uh, burning of synagogues, uh, burning of uh, Torah scrolls, forbidding Christians to work in Christian, uh, Jews to work in Christian homes, um, and to uh, confiscate uh, wealth that Jews possessed. Now, I I mention this text um, not only because it is um, uh, an artifact that I believe we Christians need to take to heart and to repent of, but also because it summarizes in particularly vivid ways uh, two aspects of Christian teaching um, developing uh, since the close of the canon in the New Testament period, say roughly 150, until Luther's day, this treatise is in 1543. And that is supersessionism, twinned with uh, what um, Jules Isaac has called the teachings of contempt. Supersessionism is the um, is the belief of principally that 
uh, choose who were once the um, beloved children of God, the covenant partners, the elect of Almighty God uh, as witnesses on his earth, now are uh, no longer the covenant people, and the Christians have taken their place, sit in their seat. The cathedral at uh, Cologne is a perfect example of this teaching where the iconography exhibits two women personified as church and synagogue, the church in full regalia um, reigning um, in, in power and authority, um, the synagogue blindfolded, her scepter broken. These are, are twinned with teachings that were sometimes uh, doctrinal and sometimes popular, uh, that Jews were in some way um, an irritant, a, a rebellion and an alien element within Christendom. In popular imagination, it had to do with um, uh, Jews being um, the only ones uh, allowed to serve as um, bankers in medieval Europe because of Christian teachings about loaning and, and interest. Um, belief that Jews uh, poisoned the wells of Christians, that they imitated Christian belief, um, offering a, a kind of demonic Eucharist um, with the host soaked in the blood of Christian children. Um, these, these elements uh, show a, a profound um, Christian uh, fear of those who are their near neighbors and kin. And both these elements, the supersessionist themes and the teachings of contempt uh, find their epitome in Luther's treatise. Thank you so much, Kate. That's uh, a lot to cover in, in just a few minutes. So I wanna to turn to Ben and, and ask you, Ben, you, if you could explain a bit about how this anti-Judaism that Phil and Kate have just spoken about affected Jewish identity, especially as we you know, move our way chronologically and get into the modern period. And as we see new forms of political and racial anti-Semitism layer onto these, this older theological anti-Judaism. Sure, and, and I wanna thank Phil and Kate for, for those really important descriptions of um, how, how Christian theology and, and the actions of Christians did affect um, the movements and theologies of Jewish communities throughout Europe. Um, I think it goes without saying that it affected Jewish community and Jewish identity very negatively. Um, to be perceived as a theological object violently in the sense that as a person, you are superseded by an entirely other person. That, that Jews and Judaism are irrelevant is going to take its toll um, emotionally. Um, but rather than speculate on, on the millions of, of Jews of Europe over the last thousand years and what they felt, we can trace um, how they moved. And so between the 13th and 16th century, as a result of all of the things that, that you heard uh, Kate explain, Jews were um, ex exposed um, expelled from, from lands. Probably you could count dozens of times in, in those 300 years in which they were um, sent out of the lands in which they had lived for generations, hundreds of years. Um, obviously the most famous is the Alhambra decree uh, in Spain where King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in 1492 expelled the Jews, but they expelled the Jews not simply because they were an anachronistic group of people living among um, enlightened Christians, but rather the forced conversions of Jews in, um, in the Iberian Peninsula were in a precarious place because they were standing, those communities were still living along people who didn't convert actual Jews. Um, and so rather than 
then poison the culture with, with Judaism, Jews were expelled. And from that point over the next 500 years, there's a lot of movement in the Jewish community. And I think what's really important to, to recognize in, in understanding that history is that most people in the world for the last 2000 years and even today will die not too far away from where they were born. Um, but a lot of Jewish communities within, gener within one generation were always moving. And so that's going to take a toll in terms of tradition, customs, place, being told that the languages that you speak are not your own languages, that they're anachronistic, or that you're mimicking the, the cultures of others, or that you're poisoning the genuine cultures of different, um, different territories and people simply because you're Jewish is going to change the way in which you identify um, theologically and existentially. This comes to a really important point in the Enlightenment where you have Christians that want to fight against this form of supersessionism by including Jews in a philosophical movement um, in, in the Enlightenment. And that reason independent of religion can determine the dignity of a human being. The problem is Jews are becoming racialized in the sense that their biology, their very makeup makes them incapable of understanding reason in the way that um, now, this is where the language becomes really racist. Native Europeans can, can understand these things. Um, and as we start to see the shifts in the ninth, 18th and 19th century, where religion becomes less the predominant sphere of influence and nationalism takes its place, you see these anti-Jewish and supersessionist tropes take place in, in national self-formation. To be German, to be French, to be English means that you are not Jewish. That there are arguments as to whether or not Jews can inhabit both a place of citizenship within these, these countries and be beholden to those laws while still being beholden to anachronistic uh, Jewish laws. Uh, accusations of dual loyalty, that Jews are going to be more loyal to themselves than to the, the countries that grant them citizenship. And then, of course, the, the uh, pernicious lies that come at the beginning of the 20th century from the protocols of the elders of Zion that accuse Jews of conspiring against the world to create a world divided on itself only to, um, to kill one another and prey on the, uh, on, the, on the dead, to control banks, to control culture. That some of the lies that come out of Luther, some of the lies that, that come out of the Middle Ages start to become political policies in a secular way in Europe in the 20th century. And so that really does affect the way Jews can maneuver in society and understand who they are in relation to their Christian neighbors. Thank you, Ben. Um, I know we're moving along at a, a fast clip here throughout, um, throughout European history, but if, if I could bring us up to the 1930s and take them moderator's prerogative here, I'd like to offer a few comments on how this deep-seated legacy of anti-Semitism within the Christian um, tradition was mobilized by the Nazi movement. Um, because in the 1930s and 40s, nearly all Germans were baptized members of a Christian church. About two-thirds were Protestant, but one-third was Catholic. There was a small presence of several other smaller religious communities. Um, and this doesn't mean that everyone was necessarily in the pews on Sunday mornings. Some historians estimate that church attendance was maybe as low as 5% in urban areas. But still, um, the churches were pillars of German society, and they played a very important role in shaping people's attitudes and actions during the Holocaust. And so most Christians in Germany welcomed the rise of Hitler in 1933 for a variety of reasons. There was uh, certainly German nationalism, there was strong anti-communism, there was traditional loyalty to governing authorities, and of course this convergence of, of the Nazis' own um, anti-Semitism with a deep-seated anti-Jewish prejudice that we've been um, discussing here. And so a lot of our programming um, in the programs on ethics, religion, and the Holocaust at the, at the USHMM that really dives into this history of how the churches responded to Nazism and the role of religious institutions and individuals during the Holocaust and all across Europe. 
But what I want to focus on this afternoon is um, how the Nazis capitalized on these Christian anti-Jewish images and tropes to further their own expression of radical anti-Semitism. Because Nazi anti-Semitism really converged with popular prejudices that were embedded in European society. So to go back to Kate's comments uh, on Martin Luther, by the 20th century, Luther was not just a Protestant icon, but a national hero in Germany. And so the Nazis loved the fact that he had these anti-Semitic writings. Um, and 1933 actually marked the 450th birthday of Martin Luther and happened to coincide with Hitler becoming chancellor. So there were big celebrations all across Germany. I went to, if I could ask um, Margaret to show the first slide, I want to show you uh, an image from uh, a newspaper from Nazi Germany, a very sensationalist and extremely anti-Semitic newspaper, newspaper called Der Sturmer. Uh, in fact, its publisher, Julius Stryker, was executed for crimes against humanity in 1946 um, during the Nuremberg trials. And this cover of the newspaper that we see is from 1933. And we can see how the, the cover first repeats this accusation that the Jews uh, killed Christ. It then accuses the Jews of also killing Germany. And so it inverts the figure of Jesus on the cross. And instead of a Jew, Jesus is now a personification of Germany, which is persecuted, suffers, and rises from the dead. So we can think about how this would have been perceived by ordinary Germans at the time with the suffering of World War I still very fresh in their minds. And of course, knowing that one of Hitler's central ideas was that Germany had been stabbed in the back uh, by the home front and Jews, and that is why they had lost the First World War. And so the Nazis used these Christian symbols in their own expressions of anti-Semitism precisely because they knew that it would resonate with people. There was this familiar vernacular that could be employed and they knew that people would you know, get it. Um, if you could go to the next slide to show you one more cover from Der Sturmer, again at Easter, which is important, uh, this time in 1938. Uh, and again, this is perpetuating the claim that Jesus was not Jewish. I'll give you a chance to read the translation. And then if you could go to the next one, And this is actually uh, an image from a children's book called The Poisonous Mushroom. And the, the caption uh, and the image, I think, really sums up the Nazis' views on race and religion. So it says, the, the caption says, you know, baptism did not make a Jew into a German, um, baptism didn't make a Gentile out of him. So the idea is that baptism did not make uh, a Jew into a German, nor did it make him into a Christian. So of course we see the fundamental illogic of the Nazis here because Nazi racial definitions, which were defined by the 1935 Nuremberg laws were based on the religion of one's grandparents. And so you may be asking, you know, how did religious leaders respond to these ideas? And I don't have time to, um, to, to get into the nuances here, but um, Basically, some agreed, some had a vision of a so-called racially pure church and tried to remove converts from Judaism and so-called Jewish influences on Christianity. Others thought this threatened the theological integrity of the church and they sought to maintain the autonomy of the churches. Um, some individuals sheltered and assisted Jews throughout these years, uh, though this part of the history is very complicated too when you consider the efforts to convert Jews, especially in vulnerable situations. And so in light of all of this, um, the, the next question that we really wanna pose um, in our panel is what, what, was, what was the outcome of all of this uh, anti-Semitism uh, during the Holocaust? What happened after? Um, so I'll pose this question to Phil, you know, how do various Christian bodies come to terms with what happened in the Holocaust given this long history? Uh, thank you. And thanks for the, again, my colleagues for these wonderful, concise uh, summaries of, of a lot of history and a lot of um, factors. Um, I'm going to, uh, 
I'm going to prefer to use the term Shoah rather than Holocaust um, to talk about the Nazi genocide um, because of the religious connotations of Holocaust as a sacrifice to God. Um, Shoah, the Hebrew word for a devastating whirlwind, um, uh, to me feels more, more apt. So let me begin by saying that, um, and thinking of the images that Rebecca just showed, there were Christians, uh, both Catholics and Lutherans and others, who were quite alarmed by, um, by those images and how Christians seem to be very easily co-opted into Nazi racialist rhetoric. Um, and there have been several studies of this and, and others still in the works, but one of the factors that made it difficult for them to mount a religious defense against Nazi anti-Semitism was the belief that uh, Jews were cursed by God because of the crucifixion of Jesus and or rejecting the Christian gospel over the centuries. And then attitude prevailed in popular society that if misfortune befalls Jews, well, that's basically their fate. That's, that's their doom because of this um, this uh, malediction that God had pronounced against them. Um, you had you had Christians uh, before the Shoah broke out uh, who themselves thought that that the curse uh, was existing, that they hadn't critiqued it yet, and thought that maybe the Nazi um, uh, oppression of Jews would be a sort of apocalyptic event that might induce Jews to finally turn to Christ. So. What I want to zero in on is that after the Shoah, Christians were, of course, appalled that this horror could have occurred in the heart of Christian Europe. Um, and they began really for the first time, as far as I know, to critique uh, this notion of a blood curse upon Jews. Um, an important meeting occurred in the Swiss town of Seelisberg in 1947 called an Emergency Conference on Anti-Semitism. When I first heard that title, I thought this is a little late in coming after the Shoah, we're now having an emergency conference on anti-Semitism. But I later learned that that title was chosen because there were still significant anti murderous anti-Semitic violence occurring in parts of Europe even after the Shoah. And that was the emergency to which the organizers uh, of this event were responding. This conference issued a uh, statement called an address to the churches with uh, 10 principles or 10 requests, uh, uh, points that were made to the Christian churches in terms of preaching accurately. Uh, some more of this may come up in our discussion later. Uh, and there were other documents issued by local churches uh, of various denominations. Uh, but probably the one that had the greatest impact worldwide was when the Second Vatican Council, um, a, a conclave of all of the world's Catholic bishops, uh, met in, the, in Rome in between 1962 and 1965. Uh, they issued a document called Nostra Aetate, um, the Latin for the opening words of the document, which means in our time. Uh, and in this document, they said several important things. First, they explicitly rejected the notion of a divine curse on Jews. Um, and as I say, that had never been really analyzed uh, in history prior to that, that, that notion, that claim. Um, the council argued that God is ever faithful and therefore uh, quoted the Apostle Paul, one of his letters, that Jews are beloved of God for the sake of their ancestors. Uh, and they strongly intimated that Jews remain in a living covenant with God. Um, if there's no curse, if there's no divine malediction against them, then their covenant must be con continuing, a holy life-giving covenant, because God is faithful and God promised to always uh, be the God of this people. Um, now, this, this uh, document issued by the Catholic Church had ripples all throughout the Christian world and many other Christian communities, and I'll mention because uh, Kate uh, focused on Martin Luther, that churches such as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America uh, issued statements explicitly repudiating the hostile ideas of Martin Luther. And I've always found that a remarkable, um, courageous thing 
for the Lutheran Church to, to criticize its own founder uh, so uh, so boldly or so uh, clearly. Um, let me just use a use a, a metaphor that I heard a long time ago to explain the impact of these developments in the Christian world. This is going to sound a little strange, but you, you'll recall that back in the Middle Ages when Galileo first uh, pointed his telescope toward the heavens, the widespread belief was that the earth was the center of the universe and that everything else in the universe revolved around it. And of course, humans lived on the earth and so the universe revolved around human beings. Um, when Galileo pointed his telescope at the moons at the planet Jupiter, he discovered four moons orbiting Jupiter. And so there are objects in the heavens that are not orbiting around the earth. There have moons going around Jupiter. And this was a shock. Uh, and combined with Copernicus's theories about the sun being the center of the solar system, et cetera, et cetera. This was a, a real cultural blow that, that, um, that our planet may be just like a whole bunch of other planets and that we're not the center of the universe. Uh, it took time for people to, uh, to adjust their thinking to, their perspectives to. Well, something kind of similar happens in Christianity, particularly Western Christianity after the Shoah. Um, it is possible for another people who explicitly reject the notion that Christ is the son of God incarnate uh, to actually be in a living, life-giving relationship with God. Uh, prior to that point, the natural assumption that Christians had was you had to be baptized in order to have uh, a blessed relationship with God. But here now the churches are saying, no, Jews are in a covenant with God because God is ever faithful to promises. That shift that change in uh, paradigm, if you will, has caused all kinds of developments in terms of how Christians understand themselves in the light of a renewed appreciation of Judaism. For example, uh, besides many statements issued by many churches filling volumes just to reproduce the documents, um, Jews and Christians started to study together. They started to dialogue about their religious um, um, traditions with in a non-polemical atmosphere, in an atmosphere promoting understanding. Uh, many universities and uh, offices for ecumenical relations in different churches uh, set up particular institutions to promote this kind of dialogue and interaction. Now that may, many of us are probably familiar with these things, but these, these kinds of opportunities, these kinds of initiatives did not exist until after the Shoah. So it's really a, a transformation uh, occurring in terms of, uh, of, of how Christians and Jews relate to one another theologically and also dialogically and, and in terms of life. Some churches went uh, so far, and I think this is a growing number, to explicitly declare that they were not interested in conducting missions to convert Jews specifically or to target Jews. Uh, that has a huge effect in terms of the traditional practice of always longing for Jewish conversions and taking steps to see that that would occur. Again, that's, that's really abated quite significantly in major branches of Christianity. And there are new theological questions that are starting to be addressed that really have never been asked. I know this is going to sound hyperbolic, but really have never been asked since the days of the New Testament and that Jews and Christians are uh, working together in exploring. And I'll say more about that perhaps a little bit later. So the, the, to sum up these comments, uh, Rebecca, the, the, what the Shoah did belatedly was to impel Christians to examine their past teachings about Jews, particularly the notion that they were under a divine curse. There was a rejection in most Christian communities uh, of that assumption of a curse. And that broke open a whole possibility for a new relationship and a new rapprochement. Um, that, that's how I would sum up the post-Shoah developments. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll turn back to Kate now, uh, because you teach the, uh, systematic theology at an Episcopal seminary um, here in the US. And so I'm wondering if uh, you could speak to how this legacy of theological anti-Semitism and all these changes that happened um, after the Holocaust that Phil has just described, how this affects, um, sorry, sorry, um, how does this legacy affect how you teach uh, and prepare students for ministry uh, in, in, your, in your work at the seminary? Uh, 
Oh, I think you need to take yourself off mute. All these uh, months in Zoom land, and I still don't get the mute unmute. Um, thank you, Rebecca. This, uh, as I say, is um, a deep matter of, of conscience and constant conversion for me, and I think should be in my teaching. It's, it's one of the uh, central questions, I think, in systematic theology, um, how Christians understand um, Jesus's own Jewishness, um, how it relates to his teaching, um, to his uh, fellow um, Jews in this period, and how to understand the passion itself. It, it has been a, a steady anti-Judaic theme in uh, Christian teaching to set Jesus over against Judaism in ways that are sometimes not explicit. And I think uh, I agree with Phil that, that since Nostra Aetate, Christians have been very careful about this. Um, but this fundamental dynamic uh, that Susanna Heschel has pointed our uh, attention towards so ably of seeing Christ as somehow over against Jews and Judaism uh, remains. And I'll just give um, a, a couple brief examples of this. Um, one is to um, take the, the sayings against uh, certain Pharisees who uh, opposed uh, some of Jesus's teachings and, and it seems particularly um, his, um, his calling uh, a, a tax gathered uh, into his disciples um, inner circle um, and uh, e eating with unknown and notorious sinners. Um, this has often been taken as uh, an example of, um, of Jesus uh, telling us that uh, we, we should not be um, legalistic. This, this term is, is used to um, not say um, Jewish directly, um, but is a way of summing up uh, what the scripture of Israel amounts to, um, or thinking of Pharisees altogether and as a whole as hypocrites based on uh, one of the parables about the Pharisee and the publican. I think uh, other legacies like this that um, that uh, concern me um, are the, the way in which in, in some um, uh, circles within liberal Protestantism, um, Israel's scriptures are taken to be something like a historical preparation for the New Testament. It's kind of background reading. And, um, and for that reason, uh, in some of these uh, liberal circles that, that I live and teach in, um, Israel scriptures are not considered um, it, as living um, testimony, word of God, but instead something like this, this background that belongs actually to Jews. Um, and so Christians really should have nothing to do directly with this text, but read it instead as a kind of context for the New Testament. 
Um, this causes a, a great deal of, uh, of um, unanalyzed anti-Judaism to live on in very good-hearted, um, very um, liberally well-intentioned circles. It's, it's for this reason that in Episcopal pulpits, uh, we hear very little preaching out of the Old Testament. And um, it, it is thought uh, at, um, as though, really, if we're going to talk about the gospel, we have to talk about the New Testament. And, and this is contrary to the teaching of the early church, which saw um, Israel's scriptures as the great magistra, the great teacher of uh, Christian faith. Uh, and that, too, is a, a lingering kind of anti-Judaism in some of the best and well-intentioned, um, good-hearted um, Christian preaching. Thank you. So I'll turn back to Ben, um, because you work in an interreligious context, and I know you have great success at discussing really sensitive issues across religious divides. Um, so what are some of the challenges and rewards in addressing anti-Semitism in today's religious landscape um, to, to take from your, institution, your institute's own um, tagline, um, you know, how can religious difference become a force for good? I, I do want to say I appreciate that 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 you believe that we've been successful. Um, it, it it is self-deprecating humor, but it is hard to measure success in in how people communicate with one another in regards to um, these these issues. I think just as an important part of uh, point of context is that I work with a variety of different communities, and those communities are talk about anti-Semitism very differently. So. I work with activists in Baltimore City. I work with clergy, high school teachers. I also teach retirees and, um, and high school students from a variety of backgrounds. The one thing that they all have in common is they choose to be with us and they choose to work with us. So they, they accept that anti-Semitism is a problem. Um, so that, that is a good thing coming into the conversation. However, we have a very difficult time um, discussing how we're going to, to deal with the problem of anti-Semitism because people understand how that problem manifests differently. And so I know it is a, um, it's a major faux pas for academics to generalize, but I'm going to give you two separate um, domains in which people try to understand anti-Semitism. And it's part of our work to try to put these people and these views into communication with one another. So on the first, um, you'll find that anti-Semitism is primary. And what that means is that what you've heard um, my colleagues talking about the history of anti-Judaism and supersessionism um, and becoming racialized anti-Semitism in the contemporary era, trying to understand culture, trying to understand civilization um, requires us to understand that underneath all of the, um, the great successes of we'll say the West, is this anti-Judaism, this anti-Semitism, that Western civilization is bedeviled by anti-Semitism. It is the longest hatred. Um, and that people try to understand how man anti-Semitism manifests in different contexts, but as something so generous, something unique. And so that when we talk about anti-Semitism, we're not just talking about racism. We're not just talking about religious bigotry. We're talking about, um, a conglomeration of different ways in which people uh, persecute others. So that, that is one way. Um, the other way is that there are those that understand anti-Semitism as a symptom of a much larger problem that we call white supremacy. And so when we deal with, with hate in a contemporary context or anti-Semitism in a contemporary context, understand that that's also dealing with some of the larger issues in which we talk about race. So for instance, in, in this country, not all Jews are white, not all Christians are white. And that whiteness and blackness play a role in how um, we've come to define one another and how we've come to persecute one another. 
So things like structural racism, um, how we place ourselves in particular contexts, whether urbanly, urban settings or in, um, in rural settings, depends on our orient, will, will determine our orientation towards anti-Semitism. I'll give you a very quick uh, uh, example of what that might look like. In Baltimore City, in this particular discussion of anti-Semitism, I would self-identify as white, male, begrudgingly middle-aged, um, and coming from a place of, of privilege. Um, meaning that I'm not gonna get pulled over because of who I am. I'm not gonna be suspected of anything when I go into a 7-Eleven. And so anti-Semitism is understood in a context in which I do have some privilege. When I taught at Virginia Tech in Southwest Virginia, I was a Jew, meaning that the whiteness and the privilege associated with whiteness was taken from me and there was a racializing going on. So you have these two different contexts in which people understand anti-Semitism operating. Um, both have some very deep truths to them. Um, both are very important to a critical analysis of, of groups of people, but they become incommensurate when you try to define what that is. So the two examples, we have a definition by the um, IHRA of anti-Semitism uh, a year ago. It was a working definition that was not legally binding. And then not too long after that, you had the Jerusalem de Declaration of Anti-Semitism. And so these groups are trying to define anti-Semitism. What became the, the, um, the wedge issue is that in the first case, when you start understanding anti-Semitism as something ontological, something part of the essence of our being, when we talk about um, criticizing things like the state of Israel and their policies um, towards Palestinians or um, criticizing um, just even the culture, there is a, a sensitivity in that, in participating in that um, atmosphere that you are engaging in some form of anti-Semitism. On the other end, and remember, this is also operating with anti-Semitism, you're doing a disservice um, to anti-Semitism if you can't criticize Israel's policy and use the, the tools that we've learned about how racism operates to also try to understand Israeli society. That means, that people are in a, in, a, in a big disagreement on how they define and talk about anti-Semitism while at the same time both want, also wanting to combat it. And I say this, this come, goes across Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, non-religious communities, this is a wedge issue. Why religious difference is a powerful for good, force for good, and so I'll make a plug for my, my institute here, is that these groups of people still stay with us. Um, they don't shut off. We're not asking you to assimilate into a different point of view. What we're trying to teach through interreligious dialogue is that you understand that people are different. They come to their experience differently and they come to these views differently. And there are ways in which we can work together to at least find some moments of transformation within ourselves and others, but create a certain disposition toward um, humility that we believe can help us move forward in dealing with these, these issues. So while there's a lot of yelling and a lot of disagreement, um, I will be more sanguine, at least in, in the work of interreligious dialogue, is that people who choose to come with us stay with us, which means that the more opportunities there are for people to talk and to listen and, and hear and be heard, um, the better we're going to, to get in, in talking about these, these really important issues. Thank you, Ben. And I see that my colleagues are adding links in the chat. So I encourage you to explore um, those resources. Um, Phil, I'll go back to you uh, and ask you, you know, we've, we've dealt with the past and somewhat with the present. Uh, and so looking forward, what, what are one or two, just, just one or two critical issues that still need to be addressed um, in understanding and addressing anti-Semitism in the Christian tradition. And as I was formulating this question, I thought, well, I, I'd be interested in his answer sort of overall because of your breadth of knowledge. Uh, but if you want to answer specifically in the Catholic tradition, uh, we'd be interested in that as well. Sure, thank you. Um, first, let me piggyback on, on both Kate and Ben's comments because they are, they, they've each mentioned several things that are on the future agenda of the conversation between Christians and Jews. Um, and I'll express 
uh, my first one by saying that we Christians have to realize uh, in our kishkas, uh, as our Jewish friends would say, in, in our innards, that, um, that what we preach and teach about Jews affects living Jews today. Um, when we talk about the kinds of, of uh, remarks about Pharisees that Kate mentioned, uh, for instance, that pop up in the lectionary readings, um, this can actually affect how people treat their Jewish neighbors down the street. So, um, uh, not to mention more globally. So, so this is something that we really have to continue to focus on. Ben mentioned the whole issue, and he was very eloquent. I'll just uh, add my um, um, agreement with him that the whole issue of the relationship of of Christian hostility toward Jews and the rise of racism in Europe um, are there, there's some interrelationship between those two phenomena, and uh, we need to look into that more. It's, it's probably not an accident that, in fact, it isn't an accident that these kinds of ways of thinking happened in the period of European colonialism. Uh, and, um, and what did that mean in terms of, of how Jews who were already othered in European society, um, how did that othering affect the otherings of other peoples as Europeans spread out uh, into, the, into the globe? Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, and I'll, I'll just mention a few questions without providing any answers to them, uh, that, that there are, uh, when Christians rethink their relationship with Jews, it automatically has to affect how we understand ourselves, because as Kate has been saying with regard to the Old Testament, we are, our, our tradition is, is uh, inseparably linked to biblical Israel, not to mention rabbinic Judaism that um, developed subsequent to the New Testament period. So, so there's, there are questions that touch the heart of our faith, that touch our central nervous systems. And, and such things are uncomfortable. Uh, but if we're gonna be faithful to following through on, on what many Christian churches have said since the Shoah, then we have to ask questions like, how will Christians understand Jesus as universal savior if we now also understand that Jews are living a covenantal relationship with the saving God? Uh, how do you put those two things together? Um, what, is the, what is the significance for Christians, if any, religiously, of the existence of the state of Israel? Um, we know that the existence of the, of the state of Israel is a central, um, has central meaning for most Jews in the world, doesn't have any such central meaning for Christians. So what, what does it mean that, that a Jewish state exists? What could it mean? How does it relate to our earlier theologies, et cetera? Um, how are we Christians to think, and Kate mentioned this also, if, if, if Jesus um, was a Jew, well, how does that affect the Christian religious imagination when we think of Jesus walking around on earth? Um, if we know nothing about Judaism, then to simply say Jesus was a Jew isn't going to really inform anything in terms of, of how we Christians imagine Jesus. And, and even more um, intriguingly, I hope, is if we Christians believe that the Jewish first century individual who was crucified by the Romans was raised by God to transcendent glory, then that figure is still a Jew. And what does that mean for our self-understanding as Christians? So, so these are some, <laughs> there's many more, of the kinds of challenges that, as I said earlier, have not been asked since the times of the New Testament. And I'll just end by saying that um, I, I wanna stress that I think we here in the United States, particularly in terms of Christian Jewish relations, also other interreligious relationships, but my work is specifically in, in Christian Jewish relations, um, you know, we live in the country that has the largest diaspora Jewish community in the world, living with uh, many Christians of many different denominations and, and heritages in, in close proximity to one another, at least in major population areas. That gives us an opportunity for dialogue that we've never had before in history and really doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. So I think we really have an obligation as Americans to pursue that, uh, that dialogical possibility. Thanks, I'd like to give Ben just a chance to respond to, to uh, what Phil was just saying, if, if you like. 
Yeah, I, and I'll be I'll be very brief because I I, re, I very much appreciate um, how Phil comes to this topic and how um, and the tools and and emotions that Br Phil brings to these dialogues. I think what's become important to me over the years um, in spending a lot of time in different religious communities is is learning how much people's grappling with their own tradition in relation to me has transformed the way in which I engage my own tradition. Um, so I have I've stud, studied the New Testament for, for many years and with, with experts and, and wonderful colleagues. Um, and I've begun to, to read a lot about how Jews have interpreted the New Testament over the course of 1500 years. And what you find, which is so interesting, is that when there is less persecution uh, against Jews, you find much more charitable readings of Jesus. Um, it's a de-Christologized Jesus. It's not Jesus as a Messiah, but Jesus as a rabbi, Jesus as a teacher. Um, and we at the Institute for years have been exploring these classes on how um, Jewish interpreta interpretations of Jesus have, have actually in, in indirectly informed uh, more liberal Christian understandings of Jesus. So if this is true, what does it say about my own identity and my own capacity to grow as a, as a Jewish person, but also taking into account um, the sacred works and ideas of so many other people. Um, and that creates that disposition, disposition and orientation to dialogue. That means that the boundaries that we set for ourselves and identity and the things that we hold really important to us don't have to change when we engage another human being. Um, but if we truly engage that human being, we know that that it will, um, and that it is transformational. And so what comes out of that dialogue is not predictable um, and, and shouldn't even be contained. I still hold on to my Judaism. I still am, uh, I was gonna joke and say that I'm, I'm not a practicing Jew that I perfected it, but um, I know that my mom's here. So she's the only one that's probably gonna laugh at that joke. Um, but I am a, a, a practicing and observant Jew and that my Judaism comes from all the conversations and experiences I have with so many non-Jewish people in my life. And I feel theologically enriched by it and, and not at all um, challenged that all of these ideas inform my Judaism. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, going back to Kate, you know, several years ago, you addressed a problematic stained glass window uh, in the chapel at Virginia Theological Seminary. And this, this story, I think, is very powerful and in many ways brings together um, some of the questions that our audience is probably struggling with uh, about how to bring together um, these ideas, the, the theology, and the practical um, way to, to live um, going forward. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us about the story of, uh, of what you did when you encountered this anti-Semitic imagery uh, in the chapel and uh, just tell us, uh, I'll, I'll put up a slide as well to, to show uh, the image of the before and after. Good. Um, I, um, I want you to um, pay attention first to the image that is on the left-hand side of your screen. I, I had um, mentioned, uh, briefly in my earlier comments that one of the characteristics of Christian anti-Judaism is to set Christ over against the Jews of his period. And that is um, magnified and uh, deepened in the passion accounts. Now, in the chapel that was standing, when I first joined the faculty, we had a series of windows uh, right at the uh, Western end of our chapel in which this image on the left was a central part of the sequence of the passion. This is a stained glass window of the arrest. And you see uh, Christ presented here um, in this luminous um, um, facial and, and bodily form in which the, the light surges out of him 
in such a way that he looks entirely white. And he is set over against uh, Roman soldiers who are looking up at him, but all the more significantly at Judas, who is the um, betrayer, uh, the one who identifies Jesus in the garden. And notice how the Jesus in that window looks like the Jew in the um, issue of uh, Der Stürmer that uh, Dr. Carter Chan uh, posted for us. Um, the facial features uh, that were thought to be characteristic uh, of genetic Jews, the color of the window, um, Judas is literally green, and the uh, teaching of contempt that, that Jews are um, crassly materialistic. Um, this is, um, is symbolized by his clutching the money bag. Well, I, when I saw this window and saw that we had been quietly worshiping with this window in our uh, sanctuary, I, I thought, uh, here is an image that needs to change. And fortunately, on our faculty, we have a working artist, Margaret Adams Parker, uh, who is um, particularly gifted, I, I think, in uh, figural art. And we sat down together and, and talked about this image. And I remember as though it were yesterday, her sitting down with a Xerox of this window and in a few short strokes, redesigning the entire window and the whole theological significance of it. And the result of her work is seen here on the right. There you can see how the Roman soldier or perhaps one of the disciples has the same coloration as Judas. The green now is simply his cloak. And notice how his physiology is the same, um, his physiognomy, I should say, is the same as Christ, um, and he is turning away in sorrow as much as in, um, in betrayal. Now, this is a, a, a profound recasting of what is going on in Gethsemane. Um, and lifts up the possibility of our seeing ourselves, um, not only in Peter who will deny his Lord thrice, uh, but in Judas, who perhaps was deeply disappointed in the Jesus uh, whom he thought he had um, left everything to follow and perhaps hoped that he would finally defeat Rome. Um, this, this window is, a, I think, an example of how we might take elements that we had not even seen before. And with the help of, of gifted artists, um, reclaim the passion narrative so that uh, Jesus is a Jew among Jews. Thank you, Kate. Um, I would like to remind our audience to, to send in your questions. Uh, and I see that several really excellent questions have come in already. Uh, and because our panelists have done such an excellent job of staying right on time, 
Um, we, we are right at schedule. And so I would like to, before we move to, to address some of the audience questions today, I just think that this story uh, of the stained glass window pairs so nicely with another story that Phil has uh, about an uh, artistic response to changing theology as well. And so Phil, if I could just um, ask you to explain a bit about the statue that you had commissioned at your university. Um, uh, and we also have an image to show of that. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So um, as, as Kate mentioned uh, earlier, um, she described the images of synagogue and ecclesia on European cathedrals and elsewhere where uh, ecclesia church, uh, they're feminine because the, the words in Greek are feminine words probably, but uh, the figure of ecclesia or church is majestic and crowned and she's holding a staff and she's thoroughly glorious. And the figure of synagogue is bent over and defeated and her staff is broken and um, she's blindfolded in most sometimes in interesting ways. Um, uh, the Institute for Jewish Catholic Relations uh, that I co-direct with a, a Jewish colleague um, was founded in 1967. And so when the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate in 2015 was coming, our university thought it would be, uh, we, we ought to mark both occasions in, in a significant way. And it took us a while, and I won't go into all the details of, of what concept to, to run with in terms of an artistic design. But what we ended up doing was commissioning a local sculptor named Joshua Kaufman to create a new synagogue and ecclesia that reflects current Catholic teaching that sees them as equally dignified, both in covenant with God. So uh, synagogue has not lost her crown as she has in the medieval depictions. Uh, and not only that, we wanted to show them interacting together, not just simply standing there sort of looking at each other across the, the entry to the church. So outside of our chapel, which is the closest we can come to a cathedral, um, uh, the, the, we put this sculpture up. If you can show that uh, image, Rebecca um, or Julie. So, um, if you look at the close-up picture on the right, you can see that both women are crowned, they're equally dignified, they are holding the sacred texts of their respective traditions, the Torah, which will identify synagogue for you, and, and the, the book of the Christian Bible for, for ecclesia or church, and they're looking at one another's texts, and that was a deliberate choice on the part of the artist in conversation with Adam Gregorman, my colleague, and myself, uh, and uh, again, the point of it is to show that, the, that in Catholic teaching and, and in other Christian traditions teaching as well, we are called to be um, um, journeying together in fellowship and in covenant with God. Uh, by fortuitous uh, timing, Pope Francis visited Philadelphia two days after the sculpture was dedicated, stopped by the university in order to uh, to dedicate it, to bless it, I should say. And uh, with him was his friend, the third individual on the right in the photo on the left, Rabbi Abraham Skorka from Argentina, who has been conduct. They, the two of them were friends long before anybody in the United States had heard of Jorge Bergoglio. Uh, so they had been conducting dialogues, did TV shows together, written book. Um, and so in a, when, I'll just end by saying when uh, when uh, Rabbi Skorka went up to embrace Pope Francis after the Pope had blessed the synagogue and ecclesia sculpture, his words were pointing to the statue, they are you and I, Pope and Rabbi, learning from one another. Uh, and that's exactly the, the mission of our institute and uh, I think where the theological trajectory in much of Christianity, certainly Catholicism, uh, is going. Thank you, Phil. All right, I would like to turn to some audience questions now. And I'm gonna start by sort of combining three different questions that have come in. Um, because one person has asked you know, a more general question about what steps can people take to address um, anti-Semitism that they encounter. Um, and someone else asked a much more specific uh, question 
about whether um, it is insulting to refer to the Pentateuch or the Torah as the Old Testament. Um, and someone else has asked a question um, asking about more, if there are more theologians uh, or scholars working on this topic, um, and there certainly are, and I know that many are, are friends of, of all of yours. And so I, I really see the, these questions as, as different parts of the same question, both big and specific. Um, perhaps Ben or Kate would like to take a stab at that. I, I'll, I'll um, take a stab at the, the one that seems um, particularly suitable for me because I've used the, the words uh, Old Testament. And I, I think um, this is a, a proper way for Christians to refer uh, to these books um, that we share at, in part with um, rabbinic Judaism. I, the reason I don't think um, it is insulting, uh, th there have been strong cases made against using the words Old Testament. Um, some of my colleagues prefer the term Hebrew Bible. Um, some Christians have used First Testament. Um, but I, I use the word Old Testament to refer to that which is primal. Um, I, I consider it the great teacher of the church. And um, and the New Testament is a um, is a reflection and meditation upon this uh, primal document. So, in in the way that that our God is the Ancient of Days and of old, uh, in just this way, is the uh, covenant um, from everlasting and uh, of old. And so I, I think it's, um, it's important to see that it is this very testament that teaches about the, the new covenant in Jeremiah 31. Yeah, um, so it, um, Old uh, Testament uh, can't mean um, out of date or no longer valid. All right, thank you. Um, another question for, and I think this one uh, should be directed to Phil uh, because you have been at the center of this, but someone is asking about um, the recent remarks that Pope Francis made in August that have raised concerns about supersessionism. And I, I do think that this is relevant to our conversation. And so maybe in, in light of time, you could not get into the actual issues, but rather um, point people in a good direction uh, for how to to learn more about this, and maybe you could say something about the larger significance. I am unmuted. Uh, so uh, uh, the, uh, the the recent sort of uh, controversy arose in Pope Francis's weekly audiences where he's been addressing a series of them uh, in um, expounding on Paul's letter to the Galatians, a New Testament book. This is a very difficult letter to interpret. There's a whole history of how Paul has been misinterpreted over the centuries. Uh, but in, in focusing on, on the text of Galatians, uh, the Pope made certain remarks that contemporary Jews today and contemporary Christians today could take um, as espousing Catholic teaching today about Jews and the Torah or Jews and the law. So that's the nub of the issue. It's the same thing that Kate said earlier that I put in my way later saying that we have to be conscious about when we're preaching to our own congregations that that affects people outside the church community uh, as well as possibly reinforcing some stereotypes we want to get rid of. So for I will put into the chat a, a link to um, to something I wrote that analyzes the controversy. You'll get more detail than you probably want, but, um, but perhaps that will uh, 
serve in the interest of time. Thanks, Phil. Um, one more question for for Ben. You know, we we had a, a comment in uh, from the audience about how a lot of religious conflict seems to come from beliefs uh, and and teachings. And so, I guess I, I would like to sort of formulate a question from from this observation. And so, I'm wondering about the people that come to your um, educational programs. I'm wondering what kind of you know, religious literacy they come with, um, whether they're high school students or uh, members of the public. Do you find that a lot of that first that people understand and are aware of these theological um, teachings that we've been discussing today? Um, and, and just that is there a difference among different parts of the population? So it's a it's a complicated uh, question to answer. So we, we do many courses and we've been doing them and they are for free and I'll make the plug that you can go to our website that we're doing them online, they're free. But when they're in the building, we, we do a lot of teaching, but, but table work. So people get to study with, um, with their neighbors and get to unpack some of the, the deeper and, and complex issues that are within the different religious traditions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, I would say that it's a wide range of, of experience and expertise. I think that all of us, um, and I think even um, my colleagues included, we, we, we always feel that we don't know enough or that we can't speak um, to the, the beliefs that we say that we espouse. Um, and so that, that's sort of a ticket of admission into to our work. We're, we're not declaring expertise. Um, what we're asking is for people to, to go on a journey because they, they believe that this experience will not only make their lives better, but will make um, their communities better and, um, and stronger. Um, it, it's long work. I think what's also important to recognize is that what my colleagues were describing in the works of um, their, their different uh, Christian communities is changing the direction of 1800 years. Um, requires time, patience, humility. Um, and not everybody comes to our institute with that. Everybody comes with um, their own idiosyncrasies. So I, I would say that um, literacy is always um, mixed, um, but I will say that the, the intentions are, are really important. Um, when there were lots of uh, incidents against Muslims, um, there was a lot of movement for people wanting to understand more about Islam and Islamophobia. Um, uh, after the Trio of Life shooting, um, we had uh, Muslims and Christians reaching out, what can we do? Um, the, the first thing that, that I would suggest you can do is listen um, and that your experience, and don't interpret the experiences of others uh, in a way that will make sense to you. Let those experiences inform how you relate to those people. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll just say that when, when we have high school teachers in our fellowships, they're bringing different questions. Um, when we have activists, they, they bring very different questions. When we work with clergy, they bring very different questions. But the central aspect is how can we make our communities and the people around us more aware of um, these, these really dangerous ideas and how these dangerous ideas sometimes inform our own um, and, and how we can deal with that. Uh, together and without pointing fingers and without making accusations, but understand that they were all in this trying to learn. Um, that's, that's what I, I could sum up what we do uh, in, in terms of when people come in with varying levels of literacy. Um, it's all good. Well, thank you so much. And we are at 3.30 and I would like to invite uh, my colleague from the National Cathedral, Michelle, to come and give um, a few closing remarks, but thank you to all the panelists and to the audience uh, for tuning in and, and for your questions and comments today. Hi hey, everyone. I uh, just want to uh, take a moment to uh, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, this has been, an extraordinary opportunity for me over the last several months to learn and listen to our colleagues at the Holocaust Museum 
and many other folks who have helped the cathedral prepare to welcome the um, Elie Wiesel's carving into our space in a way that demonstrates our depth, the depth of our commitment to interfaith relations, to being a house of prayer for all people. And uh, I will tell you that um, I, uh, Philip and Kate and Ben and Rebecca and I and uh, Julia and Margaret, who you can't see, but who are doing all of the background work here, have had several extraordinary conversations in preparation for this, each of which I have left feeling as though there's so much to learn and there is so much warmth and openness in this community for this kind of conversation. And I, I will just add that in a, a time of really deep division and conflict in our country, these conversations have been a bright point for me as a person of faith to know that we are unlikely to, to exit this time of difficulty uh, quickly, but that it really will require the kind of effort and engagement and thoughtfulness that Philip and Kate and Ben and Rebecca and so many other people bring to this kind of work. And so it's been an inspiration to me to, to get to, to be on the fringes of this conversation. And I look forward to more. And I look forward, I think, with all of you to an opportunity for us to gather together sometime in the spring when we are not quite so worried about our health and safety and it can have some conversation and can perhaps, as Benjamin suggested, do some study alongside one another uh, at that time. So we look forward to seeing you again and uh, again, extend such a real gratitude to our panelists and uh, Rebecca today for helping to make this event happen. And um, uh, Leonard and I and Margaret at the Cathedral are, are very much looking forward to being part of this ongoing talk. I will, I will close there and uh, send everyone on their way. So those of you who are joining us online, thank you. We look forward to seeing you in person um, for sure sometime in the next year. Take care.